I'm Gordon Waite from Waite Research. Right now we have quite a few Renegade telescopes in production and oftentimes for the larger ones we make the diagonal secondary mirrors ourselves. And right now I'm doing a batch of them and I wanted to show you one of the aspects of doing it that's a, a little bit weird <laughs> or a little bit unusual. Uh, right now I'm making a set of three diagonal mirrors. Uh, this is a little three and a half inch mirror that's the right size to go in a 16 inch Renegade telescope. Uh, this is a 5 inch minor axis mirror and that's about the right size for a 20 or a 22 inch Renegade. And the last mirror in this group is the big one. And this is a 6.5 inch minor axis uh, secondary mirror which is about the right size for a 30 inch Renegade telescope. So uh, this is a, a little on the big side and uh, hard to find these commercially and that's why we usually have to make them ourselves. Uh, after the mirrors are ground and polished, uh, they're tested using a Newton interferometer. Now, to test on a Newton interferometer, the mirror has to be clear. You have to be able to see through it. Uh, the interferometry test is basically you have a standard flat, and you put your flat that you're making on top of it, then shine a monochromatic light through it, and you look at the interference pattern, the, the lines that are produced. So uh, after grinding these mirrors, they, the backs have to be polished as well as the front. So the trick to doing that is that you don't want to spend a lot of time at it because you're not really making an optical surface. You just need it to be clear enough to be able to make this test. So my process is to do all sides of these mirrors first with the grinding and then uh, uh, polish the fronts with the normal pitch polisher as you would. Uh, after going through the standard grit sequence. I, on these, these are all pre-generated. Uh, they're Blanchard ground flat. And so I just use a common 25, 12, 9, 5 micron series to do the grinding. Uh, then do the fronts with pitch like normal. But before I do that, I want to make those backs transparent. So to do that, I use polishing pads. Now normally, in a good optical shop, you don't find polishing pads being used very much. Uh, polishing pads are a synthetic material. Uh, they, they sort of come in the same line as, as op opticians that used to use felt for polishing. Uh, but these are synthetic uh, uh, material. And basically you stick them on a flat surface and then use normal cerium oxide with them in water. And you polish on that flat surface with these polishing pads instead of using pitch. Uh, in order to facilitate this though, you kind of need a flat tool uh, to stick these on. Now most people when they're grinding flat mirrors like this, a lot of times you use what's called the ABC method, where you take three mirrors and you grind, you name them A, B, and C, then you grind A on B, B on C, C on A, then you flip those stacks over and grind C on uh, A on C, C on B, and B on A. So anytime you do three surfaces like that, they all come out flat because that's what the geometry demands. Well when you have mirrors of disparate size like this, a little three and a half, and a six and a half, you just can't do that. The, the little one won't fit under the big one easily. It would tip and rock and it just wouldn't work out. So at the same time I make those three secondary mirrors, I also make uh, just a normal round flat. And this one is an eight inch flat. So uh, this gets put into the sequence with all of the other secondary mirrors and comes out just as flat as they do. But the advantage of this, instead of ABC, you have the ABCD method. Uh, but it does leave you with a nice flat at the end that you can stick these polishing pads on and use those to polish the backs of the mirrors. Now normally, as I mentioned, you don't use polishing pads to do optical surfaces. They, they leave a, a poor surface and they're prone to some problems like turn down edge and things like that. So you wouldn't want to use them on the front sides of the blanks, but on the back it's just fine. And the other advantage is, because it's not an optical surface on the back, you can go like a bandit. So you put the motor on fast, on high, you use a lot of pressure, and you just polish quickly to get those backs clear enough to use. So I'll show you a little bit about uh, how these blanks are done in terms of the grinding. Then we'll put these polishing pads on the little blank, or on the, on the round blank, and do a little polishing. Grinding a flat is uh, pretty much like grinding any normal mirror except that it's glass on glass instead of glass on ceramic tile. Although you could use ceramic tile tools, it's a little more convenient with the ABC or ABCD method to use glass on glass. 
I go through the 25 micron, 12, 9, and 5 micron cycle. Basically, you just put a little bit of a abrasive on the mirror, and it doesn't take very much, actually just a few sprinkles. And then uh, place the other disc on top. These are, of course, clean, and uh, you don't want to have dust on them. But basically, it just goes on top. Spread it around gently. Now, the one problem with flats is they are subject to vacuum locking, where the two will lock together. And to avoid that, you have to keep them wet. Don't let them go dry, or they will lock together much easier. Uh, we'll turn on the turntable at a fairly low speed, and then basically just do a, a set of strokes. Rot I rotate the top piece in my hand, and then the turntable rotates the bottom piece. And you don't have to be quite as uh, careful about strokes as you do with normal mirrors, because uh, you're going to have so many different surfaces uh, rubbing on each other that they kind of go flat naturally by themselves. I do monitor the process with my uh, precision computer-controlled spherometer, so I do know that they are flat and getting flatter as the process continues. Now, in this case where I'm working on the backs of the flats, it's not really important that they actually be flat. Uh, it's more important that they just get ground out uh, through the abrasives so that they're easier to polish out. Uh, so you don't have to worry with the backs on them being flat. So after you've got the grinding done on all of the surfaces, uh, you move on toward uh, to putting the polishing pads down and starting the polishing process on the backs. Polishing pads uh, normally come on a roll of about 250 pads on a roll. And they're actually quite cheap. Um, if you buy them online from people that sell mirror making supplies, you probably pay about $20 for 50 pads, 50 individual pads. But uh, if you buy them from an optical company, uh, like the company that supplies material for polishing eyeglass lenses, they're much cheaper. There may be uh, $20 for a roll of 250 or about one-fifth the price. Of course, 250 polishing pads is something approaching a lifetime supply, So, uh, but given that it's the same price, you might as well have a lot of them. Uh, polishing pads are pretty easy to apply. They're just peel off and stick on to uh, the surface that you want to populate. Uh, the polishing pads stick pretty well by themselves, but if you want to be extra safe, you could take like a hair dryer or a heat gun and warm up the surface of the, uh, that you're going to stick them on and that will help them stick down quite a little bit. Uh, basically, I will take uh, the, first pad, uh, the first pad off the roll and stick it down off center. Uh, one of the things about polishing pads is you don't want to put them in a regular pattern on top of the surface. You want them to be staggered around a little bit. Then uh, we'll take the second one off here put it right up against it like so. Now it's not important that you actually populate the whole surface, uh, especially when you're doing the back of a secondary mirror like this because the mirror is really as small or smaller than the, the, than the plate here. So then I'm going to take and cut the next one here and just use a pair of scissors and chop it up a little bit. So, the other half of that one, like this. Once again, I'll cut this one in half. Leave it off. Place this one over here. Now, I've pretty well got it populated, so on the, the last few here, I'm going to actually cut them down to the individual petal on the flower. <laughs> so, uh, we'll take one here and put it on. This one, maybe we'll here. I'm actually down to my very last pad here. 
and they stick that last one down with a piece of tape. So I'm going to cut up to that piece of tape. I don't want to peel it off and try to use it under it. That wouldn't be a good idea. But I'll use every last little bit here because I want to get a little better coverage here just in case. Make sure that you don't get any overlap of the pads. Uh, that would make a little bump in the surface there that wouldn't be real pleasant to work with. And the last one there. So we get rid of our garbage here. So now we have the polishing plate there, that mirror, flat mirror covered. And there's one last step before we use them. We just take a paper towel. Uh, I happen to use bounty towels, but any paper towel will work. And then the pair of scissors is a really good tool. I use the edge of the, of the handle of the scissors to actually burnish down the pads. And basically I just hold this down and rub them with the scissors. And you can see through the paper towel well enough to see where you're burnishing and where the pads are. And I, I basically put the paper towel on there so that nothing comes off the scissors onto the onto the polishing pad and also so that you don't catch an edge of one of the pads and lift it up. So that's it. These are now down and ready to roll. The next step is to uh, wet them down and start polishing. Now I'm ready to get things started. The first uh, secondary mirror I'm going to work on is this three and a half inch. And again I'm polishing the back side and the only reason I'm polishing it is so that we can uh, see through it to run the interference test. So before we begin, we have to get this charged up. Now, with polishing pads, they're actually kind of interesting. Uh, you run a polishing pad quite wet, and you don't put much cerium oxide on it. As a matter of fact, after you charge it up, it really only needs to be recharged uh, just occasionally, not, not anywhere as close to as often as you do a, a pitch lap, for example. So I just wet the whole thing down like that. Then uh, in my shop, I always keep two grades of cerium oxide around. I keep a high quality grade for doing final figuring, which gives the best surface quality on a mirror on a pitch surface. Then I also keep some really cheap cerium oxide, which I use for rough polishing and for doing things like that, where, like, like this, where I'm just working on the back of a, of a mirror. So basically, you just want to get a little bit of cerium oxide on each one of the pads. Don't worry hugely about covering the whole thing. But uh, a few drops there. That's all we're going to need. Uh, you make sure it's good and wet. And basically you're ready to go. So the back of this mirror is going to go on here. And we'll turn on the machine to start with at a fairly low speed. Just to make sure we have no problems with our polishing pads. So basically I'm just going to polish, you know, every direction and every way with this uh, little mirror to um, get the back to be clear. So you can see as soon as it goes wet, it's clear. <laughs> so it's a little misleading to test the actual quality of the polishing. You do have to stop, rinse it off and dry it and, and take a look at, and see. But you'll be surprised just in 20 or 30 minutes of hand work, you'll have the back of this probably clear enough to uh, use for our purposes. So basically, like I said, we're just going to work this on these pads. You want to make sure that all the pads are down well enough that they're not going to come up or you're not going to catch an edge. So while I'm at low speed here, I test each one, make sure the little mirror passes over it. Then as I'm polishing again, I'm going to stroke kind of in every direction and I want to keep rotating this mirror in my hand. So I'll do some strokes, then rotate it in my hand, do some strokes, rotate it in my hand, do some strokes. Uh, again, this isn't an optical surface, so you don't have to be as regular as you are with a normal mirror. Uh, my only intent here is to get the thing polished out. I don't care if it's flat. I don't care if it has poor surface quality. The only thing I care about, care about is that it gets clear. So I'll polish for a little while, and uh, we'll come back and, and have a look and see what the little secondary mirror looks like then. Well, I've worked this mirror by hand on the polishing pads 
for about 10 minutes. And even in 10 minutes time, you can see that the mirror is nearly clear. Uh, if I look at it with this graph paper in the background, you can see on the right hand edge of the mirror, you can see the graph paper very clearly. Uh, in the center, it's just a little blurry. It's not quite polished out there. And then on the left hand edge, it's clear again. Uh, also down at the bottom, you can see it's clear. And what's really happened is that the outer ring of the mirror has polished uh, pretty much completely out right now and the only place that's still blurry is in the center. So that's after just 10 minutes of polishing. I would guess that when we get down to 20 minutes or 30 minutes tops, uh, this little mirror will be clear all the way through. Well, after 20 minutes of polishing, our little mirror is almost polished out. Uh, all the way around the outside is clear. The only place is just about the one inch center, and it's just a little bit furry is all. So uh, after 20 minutes, we're nearly done here. I'll give it another 10 minutes just to make sure that center looks really sweet. But uh, obviously it's uh, pretty quick to polish out a mirror this way. Well, the back of this mirror is all finished up. I gave it another 10 minutes. So it's had 30 minutes total of polishing by hand on the polishing pads. And the back of this little secondary mirror is now clear. So uh, next step will be to see how it works in my Newton interferometer. This is my Newton interferometer. It's uh, basically just a box that I built out of Baltic birch. Uh, I put a stain on it so it would look okay. Uh, basically it's put together with box joints, appropriate for a box. Uh, and its only function is to serve as a, you know, a dark place to put the mirror that's under test and a place to put the lights that you use to test it. And this is the business side of the interferometer. Uh, down here there's an opening where you put the mirror that's under test and your test piece, uh, your standard. Then uh, there's a place up here where the lights are. In the top you can see the lights are an easy thing. I just put these lights on an uh, electrical card like this. And they're just red lights that you can get at any big box store, Lowe's or Home Depot. And the front of this box opens up so that you can see the internal structure. Now inside here, there's lights in the top and the whole sides are covered with reflective aluminum foil so that the light can bounce around in there. And even the front flap here has aluminum foil on it so that we get reflection. Then down inside at the bottom of the light area, there's a diffuser. And that diffuser is just a piece of plastic that I bought at a hobby and craft shop, a place like Michael's. And then the whole kind of secret to it is this plate of glass. There's a plate of glass in here that runs at a 45 degree angle. And that plate of glass allows the light to come through the top of the box, down onto your mirrors, then back up to that plate of glass, and it gets reflected back out so that you can see uh, the interferometry uh, to be able to see the bands, the interference bands. So that's just cut in there at a 45 degree angle. And when I built this box, I was careful to size it to fit the piece of glass. So it's 11 inches across on that slot. You can see at the very bottom, there's the two pieces of glass that are under test. And the whole inside of the bottom part is covered with uh, either black, uh, dark black paper or the same uh, velvet that we use inside our Renegade telescopes at the top. So it gives a nice dark background. So to use the interferometer, you can just close it up like so. And I'll see if you can see, I'll turn out the lights from the camera. And if you get down there, you should be able to see the bands on the mirror. And this is the actual view of the mirror under test in my Newton interferometer. The elliptical secondary mirror is sitting on top of my test flat. And you can see the bands uh, on the surface through the mirror. So we have managed to clear the back enough to be able to see the bands on the interferometry test. Uh, this mirror surface, the other side, the one we didn't polish, uh, is sort of flat. <laughs> it's about a, a half wave or so. Uh, you can see that the bands aren't straight on a nice flat mirror if you have a good test piece. Uh, the bands should be straight and true. And here you can see that they've got a little curve to them. 
a little more at the bottom than the top. So uh, the other side of this mirror isn't particularly flat, but we have managed to clear the back of this mirror so that we can do this test, and that was the goal all along.